listening to the Fantasy Takeaway Podcast with Murphy Hamilton and Joe Pollock. Proud member of the Full-Time Fantasy Podcast Network. Subscribe, listen, take home the title. What's up, Takeaway Nation? Welcome in to our Week 6 review episode. Jeff, Joe, this has been a heartbreaking week for me. How'd you guys do? <sighs> Man, I had a rough week for my teams. I, I don't even really want to talk about DFS. That was terrible too. But on my live stream, there is a world where I could hit 75% correct this week, which is pretty astonishingly high. Like I've done a lot worse than that the last few weeks, but that would be a real nice feather in my cap. I can dig that. I uh, I had a rough week too, actually. I mean, my, my dynasty teams and my normal leagues and all that, they did fine. DFS was a little rough, kind of like you guys were talking about. Um, but I did come out positive. I, I was net positive all of $4 this week. So I'm really excited about that. Nice. I, uh, <laughs> I had two teams that remained perfect, but those were my only two victories this week. Ooh. Yep. I'm still just super upset. My hometown league. I lost to the only person that would have beaten me this week. I had a really good consistent week with everybody scoring about, 12 to 20 points. It just felt like a great week. And then you just look at who you're playing and go, well, this wasn't even worth trying. Been there, buddy. Been there. Hello, Stefan Diggs. That's why I like what uh, Joe suggested we do in our uh, admins and mods league, where we actually have a win added to your total. If you are in the top half percentage of scoring for the week, isn't that how it works, Joe? Yeah. Sleeper added a new function this year, which is really sweet. You can make it so that every week you play a, game against the league median so in a 12 team league essentially that's the average of the two middle scores which is pretty cool yeah it's pretty all right i've heard of a lot of leagues doing that where the top half of scorers get that second win so or one win rather if you manage to lose and you're the second highest score murph yeah i I just, I just feel like that would make you at least feel better during the week like Hey man, this is fantasy football. All right. There's no, uh, you know, there's no participation ribbons and feel good trophies here. This is all about, uh, you know, W's and L's. The funniest part about that is, is that's a league where I got the number one overall pick and I drafted Saquon Barkley and I've won some games, but I've lost to the median score almost every time. I've won. <laughs> it's like, I was pushing so hard for it. And now I'm like, I'm like two below 500 just because I've lost those. That's rough. Yep. Reminds me of a, a meme that I've been seeing recently. It's uh, that a screenshot from Lord of the Rings, the scene where they're going to throw the ring into the, the mountain and he refuses to do it. It's like, trade Saquon. You need to uh, build better consistency on your team. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm keeping Saquon. I'm going to win that league down the stretch just with all my players getting healthy. Nope, we're not going to let you win that league. All right, let's dive into the show. Guys, there's no news to talk about, really. Nothing important. I mean, Chris Herndon has been activated for the Jets. There's a lot of injury stuff we're going to get into on Thursday. So I have a couple of things I want to start the show out with in its place. First thing is Lamar Jackson. Let's talk about Lamar Jackson to start this show. This weekend, he set an NFL record as the first quarterback to throw for 200 yards and rush for 100 yards in the same game. And he's on pace to break Michael Vick's single-season quarterback rushing record. I believe it's about 1,210 yards I've seen as the estimate. Where do you guys think he'll finish the season in fantasy? Quarterback one, two, five, three, three, quarterback three. That's where he's finishing. You seem very confident in that. I don't know who's finishing two, but number one is going to be Patrick Mahomes. He's going to get it together with this whole Tyreek Hill thing back in action. Number two is going to be a passer. Maybe probably Matt Ryan. Number three is Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson's going to kind of poop the bed on occasion. He's not going to throw for that many yards. But he's going to run those games, so he's going to have 15 points. Where's uh, where's Mr. Wilson in your uh, your equation? I think Russell Wilson is a guy that's going to end up being hurt a little bit by his low passing volume. I'd say he's four or five. Still going to be solid as all hell, though. Yeah, I don't know that he doesn't finish in that top one or two. And the only reason why is if he stays healthy, he's running for so many yards right now. I didn't check the on pace fours, but it feels like he could go well over a grand. It just kind of feels like he's on, on his way to that. And when I look at guys like Lamar Jackson, Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson, Pat Mahomes, I see four guys that could be the top four in any particular order. So I'm not saying he's going to be one, 
but he's certainly going to be in the top four. He's in the conversation for one for sure. But I think that one of the guys that's a better passer probably just, ha- they have a few more smash weeks, four touchdowns, 40 points. You know what I'm saying? I think what will be really telling us by the time we get to about, you know, week 11, I think that might actually be the week Seattle plays San Francisco. I want to see if Russell Wilson can maintain his, you know, his presence and his ability to just keep running up numbers against what appears to be a pretty decent defense in San Fran. So that'll be the real move to see if he's going to be in the top four. And if he's not, then that just strengthens the case for Jackson to be top two, top three. My other question with Lamar Jackson is what his uh, trade value is. If somebody was trying to maybe add him to their roster, we've talked about how his floor is ridiculously high just with all these rushing yards. If you were going to make an offer, I don't think any of us really advocate trading for a quarterback, but if you were going to make an offer, what do you think is a solid kind of set you'd, you'd offer out there? I don't do it, man. I won't trade for a quarterback. I just can't do it. Like I'll trade him away. No problem. But it usually means sacrificing the integrity of your roster to do it. And I mean, even Lamar Jackson scoring 25.4 points per game, you could get 20 per game streaming off the waiver wire. So what is that four points really worth? If you're going to be trading away a Terry McLaurin or somebody of that nature that gets you 25, 30 point ceiling every single week. Yeah, I don't think you can do a one-for-one trade. I mean, I actually own Lamar Jackson in a handful of leagues, and I'm pretty excited to have him. Um, I've had a couple of folks ask me about trading for him, you know, truth be told, but I've been pretty stingy. It would have to be a a bigger deal, maybe something where there's three or four players from each team moving, and it would have to be something where I get noticeably better at at least two other starting positions. Because if I'm going to go and, say, start streaming off the wire and take my 20 or, you know, my 18 to 20 off the wire every week, I need to know that I'm adding between four and six points a week to other positions. And I just don't know that that's ever going to be a position where you and another owner are going to get together and find something that's going to make your team that much markedly better. 1,226 and two thirds yards. That's the pace right now. Good gravy. Well, I said it'd be over a grand. And if he goes for 1,200 rushing yards, I don't think there's any way he's not the QB1. No, he might be the QB5 and the RB5. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we call a cheat code. Now, I'm all about having cheat codes. And if you've got Lamar Jackson and a guy like Saquon Barkley, I mean, you're in a pretty good place there. The guy catches a ton of passes and runs for some yards. And then a guy that throws for a handful of touchdown passes and runs for a ton of yards. That's uh, it's not bad. I am making a t-shirt as soon as we get done with this episode that has up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B-A start with Lamar Jackson's silhouette right behind it. I love it. <laughs> I'm all about that. Send me one of those. Be I careful. Rotoware's probably already got it. They're probably listening in on us right now. Maybe. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about with Lamar Jackson is you mentioned it earlier with uh, if he stays healthy. Now, do you guys think this is a massive concern or do you think this is just something that is just something to be aware of? Because the more I watch Lamar Jackson, a lot of people compare him to Cam Newton. And I think that's just the whole rushing quarterback thing. But Cam Newton would do a lot of design runs up the middle. He'd try and take a lot more contact. Lamar seems to run out in space. He scrambles, he gets to the outside, and he doesn't see a defender for eight to 10 yards, if that with his speed. Are y'all nearly as worried about injury with him as, say, somebody like Cam Newton who runs like Cam Newton? I would say my injury concern is a lot closer to Russell Wilson when he was a a dominant rusher than it is to Cam Newton. I think that his running style is a lot more Russell Wilson-esque, personally. Yeah, I mean, I look at this guy, and the thing that would concern me if I'm really stressed out over injuries, and I'm not as a Lamar Jackson owner, but it would be a non-contact injury. It'd be something on a juke or on a where he's trying to break or cut or do something crazy. And, uh, you know, but we've seen him kind of stick that little stop move on somebody and his knee buckles like that would be the thing that would terrify me. But um, I'm not overly concerned about injuries. I don't see anything in his history that leads me to believe that he's particularly frail. I mean, he's a pretty big guy. He looks very slender, but I think it's because he's probably running low body fat percentages. I want to say he's like six, three two twenty. Like, that's not a small guy. I mean, he's not six four two forty five, but he's big enough that he can protect himself and he's not like cam where he's trying to, you know, truck everybody. All right. The other thing I wanted to start out the show with was, and let's go ahead and give Jeff his moment of happiness. Despite Joe's Jimmy G jokes, the 49ers are still undefeated with the best defense in the NFC. 
Guys, are they for real? Or as Jeff said uh, during, well, after the game, when I checked on him, made sure he had clean pants, uh, are they just riding momentum right now? I'd say it's a little bit of both, but Jimmy Garoppolo still sucks. <laughs> <laughs> like There is nothing he can do to ha- make Joe happy. Well, I mean, like, watch him play. He's just an average quarterback. Like, he's not Blake Bortles. He's pre- He's better than Jared Goff at this point, I would say. But if you're people are putting him because of this five and zero record up in up there in that elite tier of quarterbacks based on his contract and the record, and he's not that good. He's just an average quarterback. The running game and the defense are what he's gotten this team to this point. I've been I don't want to say a Jimmy G apologist, but I'm not going to say the guy's elite. He's nowhere near being elite. He's certainly not a bottom third quarterback. He's in one of those middling groups. And unfortunately, the NFL is a league where you have to overpay for quarterback. And we found that out with guys like Kirk Cousins, where he got $84 million for three years guaranteed. Like, that's ridiculous. And Jimmy G was going to command money like that without any real starts under his belt. So the Niners had to pay him and they knew it. So contract notwithstanding, we're talking about a guy that can put the 49ers in position to win and not completely piss the game away. And that's really all they need right now, because the running game has been pretty dominant even with our bookend tackles both being down and out right now. And that defense has been swarming. Uh, Every week, I just come away really impressed with that front four. And uh, every year at the draft, I'm like, why are we drafting more and more D linemen? Well, now I get it. And, you know, as much as I wanted to see some guys like, you know, Marshawn Lattimore and some other guys end up on our roster, I got to say, I'm pretty thrilled with the five-man rotation we have going on right now, especially with adding D Ford and uh, Nick Bosa, like, we're, we're scary up front right now, and I'm really, really thrilled with the whole group. Who's a better quarterback, Kirk Cousins or Jimmy Garoppolo? Ugh. I think they're both system dependent. From a physical you know, tool standpoint, they're super similar. Uh, maybe I would take... I'd take Garoppolo because he's younger, but and that's... Uh, I don't know. They're damn near the same guy. What about Matt Stafford? Uh, I'll take Garoppolo. Hmm. And it's not that I don't like Stafford. It, that's really not the case at all. I just, um, I, I don't know that I've seen enough out of him throughout his career to feel like he's made the type of progression I would expect from a number one overall pick. Does that, I don't know if that makes sense, but I he's, guess so. yeah, he's just not a guy that I've ever been that enamored with. I think if you're putting all of these quarterbacks in a Kyle Shanahan system, I want both of those guys before I want Jimmy Garoppolo. I mean, and, and all we have is just kind of like the ability to say, well, I guess I'd want that guy or this guy or that guy. I mean, I just, we have Garoppolo there right now and we're, you know, the 49ers are winning ball games. I keep saying we, and I don't mean to do that. Uh, you know, the 49ers keep winning ball games with him. So he's doing something right. And like I said, he's not an elite guy. And as a 49ers fan, I don't view him as such. I view him as a guy that's not going to cost us games, and I can dig that. Jeff, if it makes you feel any better, as much as Joe's going to shit on Jimmy G the rest of the season, he has to deal with a whole season of Joe Flacco, so he has reason to be salty, just in general. If I had Joe Flucco as my quarterback, I'd just be in a deepened, deepened state <laughs> of depression. This was the, the first game that I watched all the way from start to finish for the Broncos this year, this week. It was a boring one, too. Yeah, I mean, the defense has played well. It was a defensive struggle more than it was bad offenses. Well, with Manny Sanders going down, I lost interest in that game pretty quickly. It's fair. Cortland Sutton played pretty well. Yeah, I don't have any shares of that guy, though. (laughs) I have a ton. All right, guys, that's all I have for uh, intro topics. So let's dive into our cheap date recap. Jeff, you again took the gold this week. You beat both Joe and I. Emphasis on beating Joe. Uh, tell us a little bit about your lineup, where you succeeded and where you bombed. Um, well, actually most of my lineup bombed out. So I'll just kind of put it right out there that as a group, we were pretty terrible this past week, but, uh, you know, cousins got 31. That was a six X value at quarterback at 5,200 bucks. Felt pretty good about that. Still pretty thrilled with cousins moving forward for the next few weeks. Uh, it was Steph Diggs week called that out at 5,900. He was criminally underpriced 46 and a half points or a 7.88 X. Those were the two guys that really crushed it. You know, Adrian Peterson delivered, but everybody else was under like two and a half X. It was pretty bad. D hop didn't deliver. The dolphins didn't deliver. DD Westbrook failed. I mean, everybody else was a disaster, but uh, yeah, cousins digs 
Uh, you know, I guess we can say Adrian Peterson was a win, but um, it was a win, but it didn't feel good. Felt a little dirty. All right, Joe, I'm going to run to you next. Uh, anything you want to bring up on your lineup? You Again, you were in third place this week, place we like to put you, but did you have anything you wanted to comment on? Success, failure? I think things? at some point we're just going to have to admit that making fun of me for DFS is like making fun of your brother that gets hit on the head and can't speak anymore because I suck at this. <laughs> I don't know, man. Like Josh Rosen was a big stab and swing and a miss. 1.4 points will screw your team anyway. Chris Thompson dropped a touchdown and got hurt. Alvin Kamara, I probably would have changed out just based on that little injury concern that he had. If we'd have done this later in the week, Cooper Cup totally crapped the bed. Chris Godwin was really the only thing that looked good on this. Chris Godwin had 28.1, 4.19x. Other than that, this was an incredibly forgettable week, except the 49ers defense. That was a good call. Yeah, you got 3.7x out of the Niners D. And I think, you know, they should be a pretty reasonable defense to play moving forward just because of sack points. Yeah, not even just for DFS. Like if they're still out there on the waiver wire in your league, go spend a little bit of fab because I think that they're actually going to be a week in and week out play. Yeah, I have one league that I play team defense in and it's actually a dynasty league. The 49ers were just sitting on waivers to start the season. And I say start the season. This was in like July. So I grabbed them and stashed them. Feeling really good about that because the Eagles were the other defense. I picked him up on your advice early in the season in one of my leagues. And then last week I grabbed him because most people were scared and they were dropping him with this uh, Rams matchup in mind. And I'm like, I don't know, man, that offensive line is so bad. My entire philosophy when it comes to fantasy football is to always play on other people's fear. When your people are running away from a player, I generally like to step towards them. I put in so many digs trades and I couldn't find one. Really? Not one? Yeah, I couldn't find anybody to sell him. Mm, man. Yep. All right, one well, this with my lineup. I, I didn't do that great either. Uh, Joe and I had some similar big money players. I'm pretty proud of my Chris Carson pick as a pay down at running back, you know, getting 4.82x values, pretty solid. And only 6,000 this week. Uh, Tevin Coleman was my cheap debt running back, 14.1. Again, pretty solid. Otherwise, you know, Cooper Cup, crap the bed, like Joe said. Delaney Walker, 7.3 is respectable for a tight end, but right now tight ends are having a bounce back season, so respectable is not going to cut it. And Gardner Minshew just crapped the bed, 5.6. Ah, Gardner. I mean, I put real money into your lineup. By real money, I... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, she- <laughs> yeah, it sounds about right. It's only because you played a Murph. If either one of us would have played Minshew, he probably would have taken off and had a huge day. But he I mean, knows you don't like really the believe first him. I played him. He knows that <laughs> it wasn't Murph playing him. Actually, it was that we liked the lineup. That's what crushed this thing. Is that what it was? I told you. Okay, I yep. said that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Y'all liked it, and it's going to bomb. Yep. Yep. Well, that's good. I'm glad I could stick the, the 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 hex on you then. I think that actually Tevin Coleman was a pretty darn good call. 3.2 X isn't like smash the slate kind of stuff, but it's solid. You can win with 3.2 X out of a pay down player like that. Yeah, absolutely. And and to be fair, this lineup was not bad. Again, this, we talk every week about the process, right? So just because your process is right, doesn't mean the results are always perfect. It just means they're going to be perfect more often than not. And Murph, what you did with this lineup, I know you haven't been playing DFS as long as, you know, the Joe and I, you did really nice here in terms of building out a bunch of guys that had some high volume capability and had really high chances of getting touchdowns. And and that's what you need in DFS. And you did a really nice job with that. It just didn't pan out this week. But if you keep that strategy moving forward, you're going to find yourself ahead more than behind most weeks. You know what? I succeeded this week regardless. I beat the special kid, Joe, and that's all that matters to me. Just remember. <laughs> I, I still got three wins on the year. You've got two. Joe's got one. So, so you're still looking up to me in the standings. Good luck with that. Booth review. I see you, Joe. Just shifting <laughs> ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joe, we'll kick us off. What was your first uh, what to watch for from last week? My first what to watch for was that London game. I was watching Carolina and Tampa Bay face off in London. Christian McCaffrey 
21.7 points. Honestly, he had a pretty down week if he doesn't score those touchdowns. It was what, like 57 total yards? But he just keeps scoring touchdowns. He just keeps scoring fantasy points. Godwin crushed it, 10 for 151. If he scores a touchdown, that's a slate-breaking kind of week. Evans was really good too, but still worse than Godwin. When can we go around on Twitter and just put, toot our own horn about that? Like, when is that acceptable? I mean, I wasn't going to do it until the end of the season because I'm that guy where I can wait it out. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to find all the tweets where I talked about Godwin and how great he is and how he needs to be invested in. And I'm just going to remind people of how well those tweets aged. Yeah, I can't wait. I mean, even if they're close, like the thing that we said about the 1A, 1B, Godwin might be the 1A. I think that's pretty much been hashed out unless he totally craps the bed for the rest of the season. Yeah, the only thing that's making me a little nervous about uh, about Godwin right now is he had that little hip thing, and then he got rocked pretty good in that game, and he ended up get helped off the field. He came back a few plays later and was fine, so I don't know what was really wrong with him. But uh, you know, I just want to make sure this is a guy that's actually going to stay healthy too. And I mean, health's always a big thing. Nobody's healthy at this point in the year, but that was something where it caught my eye when I was watching that game, and it 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 sent up maybe not a red flag, but it was certainly a dark orange. All right, Jeff, we're up to you. What is your first booth review of the week? You know, I was all about the Vikings Eagles game. Uh, You know, last week we talked about the Vikings had to get right against the Giants and they did just that. Uh, They had to kind of keep that momentum against a really, really bad Eagles secondary. And I thought about it, you know, Steph Diggs being the guy and and this was going to be a little bit of a fantasy bonanza. Vikings hung 38 points and Diggs had three touchdowns. It was just that Uh, we, we got great results out of Diggs, out of Cousins. You know, Cook still looked good. You know, Thielen still looked good. Of course, Rudolph, like we said, he's garbage. He's still garbage. Uh, it was exactly what we thought it would be. And uh, I think this offense might be figuring it out where they can't just let Cousins throw it five times a game. They have to let him air it out a little bit. He's a rhythm quarterback. He needs to get those reps in. And you can balance this thing out and let Dal Cook go ahead and get his touches. Let Cousins sling it around to those receivers. This team's going to be just fine if they can keep putting the ball up 26 to 30 times a game. All right, and we're around to me. I was watching that Sunday matchup of the Texans and the Chiefs, and the game lived up to its billing. It was a really impressive game. Maybe not impressive is the word I want to use. It was an eventful game. I enjoyed watching it. But I think the two biggest stories were Tyreek Hill's return, getting 25 points in PPR, and Will Fuller with those two massive touchdown drops. I mean, those go, those drops were touchdowns if he had been able to get them. They were in his hands. Three Three, I only saw two, Joe. He dropped three passes that easily could have been touchdowns on different Uh, drives too. Like he could have had a slate breaking week again and he dropped it. I started Fuller this week as opposed to, you know, me too. Of course we did. Of course we (laughs) did, Joe. Me three. I still won both those matchups. You know, Fuller be damned. But did you guys see Tyreek Hill's touchdown celebration? No. He's coming back from injury and he's doing backflips. In the oh, end. I did see that. That was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, don't fall on your chest. Like you're the backflips yeah. putting a lot more pressure on your feet than on your collarbone. But still. Yeah. You misjudge that though and land wrong and it's a bad day. He looked like he never cool. misjudges that though. Didn't he? He yeah. looks like he just does backflips like for fun on a Tuesday while he's walking down the sidewalk. <laughs> I could see that. He seems like that kind of guy. <laughs> yeah. The, the thing that's more impressive though is that touchdown. I was watching a a thing on uh, NFL network or something and they had it measured how high he jumped to get that ball because that was actually a poorly thrown ball and Hill had to go way under thrown. Yeah. Way under thrown. Hill had to adjust to it, come back into double coverage. Basically he was 40 and a half inches off the ground, 40 and a half inch vert in pads in a game situation for a guy who was five foot 10. That was so impressive. I mean the backflip obviously, but 40 and a half inch vert and pads. A lot of guys that can't do that in shorts at the combine. Coincidentally, Tyreek Hill did that in shorts at his pro day, 40 and a half inches. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I bring up memes a lot and I saw another one that could, pertains to the chiefs. Uh, do you guys agree with the fact that Sammy Watkins is essentially the NFL equivalent of the McDonald's ice cream machine? <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw that and I was awesome. like, that is the perfect analogy. Absolutely perfect. It's so good when it works, but <laughs> never out there. Oh, God. Yeah, fun fact, in high school, uh, me and my best friend would go from McDonald's to McDonald's. Like, we'd get it in Daphne where I live, and we'd drive 15 minutes down the road to the next McDonald's and just have an ice cream cone in each one. 
because it was so good we called it Kitty Crack. Nice. Because we're stupid. Because we're stupid, you know. But it seemed fitting. All right, enough of me. Joe, we're back to you. What is your second booth review for the week? Austin Hooper, man. 25.7 points. He leads all tight ends and targets. You guys know he's on a 293-point pace at this point. Kelsey scored 294 last year. Austin Hooper is legit right now. I don't like he's had some really, really juicy matchups, so I'm not expecting him to outscore Kelsey, but he's good, man. He's really, really playing well. I got him as a throw in on an OJ Howard trade. Boom. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) That happened in. uh, Let's see. That was before the season started. That was preseason. I moved on from OJ Howard. And what's awesome is I got four players and I sent Howard like a draft pick or something like that. But uh, Hooper ended up being a stud there. And I think I got like Damian Williams and something else. This guy was really hot on OJ Howard and uh, feeling pretty great about that trade right now. Now that you're bragging about that, do you know what's going to happen? Oh, he's going to all over himself. Hooper is going to poop the bed completely. And OJ Howard is going to get traded to the New England Patriots and be the number one tight end for the rest of the season. You shut your mouth. That is awful. That's the worst thing that can ever happen. I mean, even if Hooper just, you know, totally bombs out, OJ Howard going to the Patriots is awful. And you should never wish that on the rest of the NFL. I know, but it's going to happen. I mean, I hope the fantasy gods don't smite you for that. They'll smite me by doing it. No, that no. is the hey, smite. Hey. hey, your fantasy gods, Joe doesn't mean it. Please don't let OJ Howard get sent to the Patriots. Amen. He's just trying to hurt me, man. I already have Hightower in the Patriots, and it's hard enough to root for my Alabama guys when they're on a team that I hate in the NFL. He's just trying to make me just have an aneurysm over here. Yep. <laughs> I love how he just admits it. <laughs> All right, Jeff, there you go. moving into your second booth review, what you got? You know, we were looking at some bad teams here. It was the, the Cardinals-Falcons matchup, and it, you know the Cardinals they had a little bit of momentum coming off their first win of the season, and they're starting to look kind of okay-ish. They're figuring out how to use David Johnson. It looks like they're spreading the ball around a little bit. You know, this Falcons D was susceptible to uh, getting beaten in the passing game. That's how Arizona wants to beat you. So it looked like a matchup made in hell for the Falcons. And it was. To lose 34-33, if you put up 33 points and lose, it's a bad day any way you cut it, especially when your head coach is also your defensive play caller and Dan Quinn. His job is absolutely in jeopardy right now. I don't have Schefter telling me anything. I'm not an insider here. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that if he doesn't make some very serious changes defensively before this thing's over, he won't have a job when this thing's over. It's going to be pretty ugly, I think, in Atlanta if they don't get it right real quick. And poor Matt Bryant had to buy out a liquor store after that game. He was looking so depressed on the sideline. Yeah, I mean, this Falcons team is way too talented to be one in five. I get losing Keanu Neal, but losing your starting strong safety isn't enough to take you from being, say, you know, four and two to one and five. This is a good enough team where they have a solid quarterback, solid enough position players. The O line has been a little beat up, but again, they're not suffering from injuries that are that far above any other team in the league. So to go from being a really competitive team at say four and two to being one and five is pretty embarrassing. And uh, it comes down to coaching. And I'm starting to wonder if Dan Quinn's got a job before week 17. Again, how do you mismanage what essentially could be the best wide receiver core in the NFL? I mean, I'd I'd take Julio, Ridley, and Sanu over like half the league, if not more, right now. More, for sure. More, They're a yeah. top five trio, for sure. Yeah, I think it's top five trio. I mean, when you think about Tampa Bay having Evans and Godwin, like they might be better just because their top two are so much better. You know, Thielen, Diggs, are pretty good pairing there. But still, we're talking about a very, very good group of wideouts and a very solid quarterback. He's a proven guy that can get it done. And Dirk Cutter's been there with this team before. This shouldn't be that much of a departure from things they've done recently. So uh, something is broken in Atlanta, and I'm starting to wonder if the message from Dan Quinn has gotten a little stale. All right, and we're back to me to round this out. We talked about the Niners earlier, but again, holy cow, I just didn't see this game coming. The Niners played very well outside of Jimmy G. There you go, Joe. I'm on your side for one thing. (laughs) He didn't play bad either. He did his job. He's just not that good. It's more than you can say for Jared Goff in that game. At least Jimmy G did his job. Jared Goff is bad, man. 
there was this, uh, so there, there's a story, Russell Wilson, his helmet communication went out in that drive on the third quarter and he just started calling the plays and drove him down for a touchdown. And one of the comments on that post, it's the funniest thing said, Jared Goff would have actually died if that happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so legit it's true. too. Uh, it's so legit. <laughs> weird as soon as you said he just decided to start calling plays himself i immediately got bill o'reilly in my head F- it we'll do it live <laughs> essentially what he did yeah totally i mean russell wilson's good enough to call his own plays for a whole drive though no problem he's good enough to call his own plays for an entire game if you ask me he should just call all the plays they look the best on that drive that they did out of the whole game right well they need to put the game in the hands of their franchise quarterback more often and uh, Russell Wilson, so we talk about Jimmy G, he's an, he's just a guy, right? He's an average guy, maybe average to above average quarterback. Russell Wilson should be considered an elite or very near elite quarterback. And those guys are very few and far between that can actually play at that level and call their own plays. I look at guys like Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, Tom Brady, Drew Brees. So I'm, I'm yeah, I mean, Ben forward. Roethlisberger probably could do it when he's healthy. I, you know. Actually, Ro- Roethlisberger's right there, I guess, too. You know, Rivers could be right there. I wonder if, you know, if Roethlisberger did it, if they'd ever run the ball in Pittsburgh. No, they wouldn't ever. Right. And, and that's where he'd throw it 600 and some odd times and then they'd miss the playoffs. So I don't know if I'd trust him to call plays. But I feel like the other guys and maybe Rogers actually might be a bump below a guy like Russell Wilson. So I think Russell Wilson understands how to use the run to complement what he does well. And so he's not going to be afraid to calling run plays. But Rodgers, he doesn't like handing the ball off. Roethlisberger doesn't like handing the ball off. So it might be a much shorter list than we thought. Maybe it's more like Breeze, Wilson, Brady. Do you think Matt Ryan is a robot enough to call his own plays? Because he's a total robot quarterback, but he's good at it. I don't think from a talent standpoint, he holds a candle to the other guys we talked about. And, and that's what keeps him off of that kind of elite threshold. I think mentally he can process it quickly enough. And he could probably be an elite level play caller but I don't know that he's ever going to be an elite level quarterback. He's that guy that's always going to be kind of like top 10 ish, but never be number two, two out of three years, you know, well, from a fantasy standpoint, (laughs) I mean, from an NFL standpoint, right? So we're talking about calling plays and playing at an elite level. I know I'm just messing with you. Something that really impresses me about Russell Wilson is I was reading an article earlier about why he should be in the MVP conversation. And he apparently talked about in an interview uh, after the game that, You know, he hasn't missed very many games in eight years. He's been constantly studying. And at this point, he feels confident enough in his game that no defense can throw anything at him that he won't recognize, that he can't adjust out of. Which if you've got a guy who has the talent to not only, you know, show that he can call his own plays, but can also really just read every single defense, that's dangerous. And I really do hope he's in the MVP conversation, say week 15, week 16 still. Yeah, I think like I think Russell Wilson's in the conversation for best quarterback in football. Yeah, he's never going to get there in terms of the numbers with the volume that they have in that offense. But if he played in an Andy Reid or a Kyle Shanahan system, he would be putting up these insane numbers all the time. He'd be Pat Mahomes before Pat Mahomes. Yeah. And there's when I think about Russell Wilson, I do think about an elite level quarterback. And for me, to, just to clarify, I think people throw around the elite term. Elite is the top 10 percent as far as I'm concerned. So in the NFL, there's 32 starting quarterbacks. I want the top three. Those are my elite yeah. guys. That's why I like to use the term elite or near elite. So if you're four or five, you're not elite. You're near elite. The takeaway. All right, we've done our booth reviews. Let's talk about our takeaways from the week. Things we weren't looking for last week, but kind of popped out this week. I will start off. Guys, in the Miami-Washington game, there was a whole lot of burning garbage on the field for 60 minutes. However... Towards the end, the Dolphins let Fitzmagic come in and almost make the comeback. But they weirdly went for the two-point conversion at the end of the game, thinking they'd get that when they haven't been able to score pretty much all day. Do y'all think this was a tanking decision? I think that that was certainly part of the thought process there. I think that if you if you go out and you tie that game, it doesn't do anything for you. But if you go out and you win that game, it's a little feather in your cap. And if you go out and you miss the two-point conversion, you're still getting the number one overall pick because the other team that you were playing was in that conversation as well. I stopped watching that game after about kickoff. Um, so I didn't even watch any of that. <laughs> I, you have red zone, man. You don't have to focus on the game. You can just see it when they score. Well, so here's what I do, actually. I have, uh, so I have two TVs that I stare at. 
on my wall and I run Sunday ticket on one where I kind of rotate through games that matter. And then on the other one, I play whatever the local game is. And, um, the Redskins Dolphins game came on, I think during two commercial breaks and I changed it at my soonest convenience. You go for two there. I get it. Yeah. Play to win the game. Yeah. Get your guys pumped to go for two. I don't want to say it was a tank move, but I don't know. It's pretty close. Like the, you, you can't be feeling great about your odds this season. So you got to just push all your chips in the middle of the table and hope for the best. All right, Joe, what's your takeaway from week six? It ties right into what Jeff was saying about the Atlanta Falcons. Matt Ryan is going to be a top three quarterback rest of season. And, you know, including right now, because that defense is so bad that they're just going to have to throw and throw and throw and throw. And he's going to get there just on volume alone. He's never going to be in the MVP conversation because they're not going to win enough games to get him there. But He's a good quarterback in a situation that's insanely good for fantasy. If you own him, you should be very excited about the future. Yeah, he was one of my top guys coming off the board to start uh, the season. I I think I actually had him pegged in as my number one for the year. He's not going to end up at number one, but uh, definitely feeling good about him now that, you know, it seems like at least he's figured it out and he's figured out how to get the ball to the right people. But uh, man, the rest of that team could get it figured out. The Falcons could be pretty dangerous. All right, and Jeff, we're going to round it out with you. What was your takeaway from the week? You know, this one's actually two weeks in the making. So we watched the Chiefs fall to the Indianapolis Colts on Sunday night, and then we watched the Texans roll into Kansas City and hand them a second straight loss. I'm wondering if teams have now finally figured out how to beat the Chiefs and by proxy how to slow down Pat Mahomes. Mahomes still had 273 and three. But that time of possession was completely upside down. Houston held the ball for 39 minutes and 48 seconds of this ballgame. They left Kansas City with 20 minutes and 12 seconds. If you keep Pat off the field, he can't beat you. Of his three touchdowns, one of them was that bomb to Tyree Kill where he had to jump out of the stadium to go grab it in double coverage. Granted, he does that more than anybody else, and he can get away with that more than anybody else. But it starts to make you wonder if. Now we've found out how to beat him and those, you know, astronomical numbers that we've seen from Mahomes from last season are really going to start coming back to what should eventually be as mean. I have a theory here. There is only one player on that Kansas city chiefs offense that is unstoppable. And he only played in 29 out of the 58 snaps this week. And he hasn't played in multiple weeks. Patrick Mahomes is great. Sammy Watkins is a pretty good receiver. The rest of that receiving core is okay. Travis Kelsey is a really darn good tight end, but that offense runs around Tyreek Hill. Everything that makes it efficient is because of Tyreek Hill. And if you could go back even without Patrick Mahomes to the Alex Smith season, Alex Smith is an average quarterback at At best. best. He is a game manager quarterback. He like, it says, Game manager quarterback in the dictionary and Alex Smith picture is right next to it. He made him into a top five quarterback. So Tyreek Hill coming back, getting healthy, I think is going to be just what the doctor ordered for this offense. If they can't do it with a full strength Tyreek Hill playing 90% of the snaps, then we're in trouble. But until then, I'm not that worried. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how teams continue to play against the Chiefs because the Chiefs aren't particularly great on defense either. So if you can beat them with just enough ground and pound and peppering in the past, now granted, Watson threw it 42 times, but a product of that was late in the game. This thing turned into a track meet. And again, this is just a wonder, right? It's a simple musing because I never believe a player is going to back up a career year with another career year. So when you talk about 50 and 5,000, that's a career year for dang near anybody. And, uh, and that's why I keep wondering, like, who is Pat Mahomes really going to be? Because I don't believe that's who he really is. But I do believe that 4,638 is a a pretty fair pairing. That still makes him QB1 in most leagues. But really interested to see how the future plays out for the Chiefs this year. Tapping the wire. All right, guys, let's round out this show with our Tapping the Wire segment, the staple of our Tuesday episodes. Let's start with quarterback. We've got Sam Darnold with a 12% ownership and Kurt Cousins with a 36% ownership. Where do you guys want to start? Darnold or Cousins? Darnold. I like Sam Darnold. I think that Sam Darnold is a darn good quarterback. They're 
offensive system isn't all that conducive to producing a ton of points for fantasy for quarterbacks, but I, I think Darnold might be the best quarterback that Adam Gase has had since Peyton Manning. I don't think he is Peyton Manning, but I especially in a two QB or super flex league, I think you could still go buy Sam Darnold for a reasonable price and I'm into it. Yeah, I didn't love Darnold coming out. Uh, I just had some issues with the way he handled some interview questions on TV. And that was definitely an over overthinking it moment for me. But watching this Jets offense without him and then suddenly with him against a pretty decent Cowboys team, like they're not really slouch, you know, they're they're not that awful. But he came out and he looked really good. 23 of 32. He went two and one. 338 yards, and he's got some real cupcakes coming up. New England's up next. They're tough, but Jacksonville, Miami, the Giants, Washington, Oakland, Cincinnati, Miami again. He's in line for some pretty big numbers here, and maybe you grab him and you keep him stashed as a QB two if you got a you know a, a deeper league and you can you know keep that extra guy on your bench. But man, I'm starting to like Darnold a lot. I love what I saw and the way he commanded that offense. Loved his ball placement. He just looks so dang good. All right, anything on Kirk Cousins, or is it just kind of that offense is high-powered, those wide receivers are legit, Kirk Cousins is going to be a decent option? Yeah, my thought here with Cousins is that this offense is starting to turn a corner, and I I think Mike Zimmer knows his job's on the line. I doubt very highly they start to slide back into that whole, let's let Cousins throw it between five and ten times a game. They've got to you know put the ball up. They know they have to because it's going to open up the run game better. They need the run game to keep the passing game going, and your odds are you're not getting Diggs or Thielen off those owners. So you can get a part of those two wideouts by picking up a low owned quarterback in Kirk Cousins. I would rather have one of the rushing floor quarterbacks because I I guess maybe they aren't going to fall back into that run, 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 run pattern. But if they go up, that's how that coach runs teams. That's what he does. That's what Mike Zimmer wants to do. So from that point on, if they're up 21 to nothing in the first quarter and Dalvin Cooks had two of those touchdowns, Her cousins might only score four more points the rest of the game. So I'm looking for a guy like a Josh Allen off the waiver wire, as opposed to a Kirk cousins, especially with that schedule coming up. Yeah, I can appreciate that, but Josh Allen, man, and I know a lot of folks are sweet on him right now because he does have a pretty cushy schedule coming up, but man, he gives the ball away a lot. And if you lose points for interceptions and for fumbles and fumbles lost or any of that kind of stuff, you might be negating that rushing floor with turnovers. And this isn't a guy that's going to give you 275 and two or three every week. He's going to give you like 200 passing. So you need him to give you 40 and a touchdown on the ground just to offset what he's not giving you through the air. Like I said, he's a DFS guy. I like him. You know, I think he's a, he's a good story. He's been playing better than I think most people thought he would. But if given the choice between say him and Daniel Jones, I might take Daniel Jones because he's a better passer and still offers you some of that rushing floor. That is absolutely insane. Look at these numbers for Josh Allen since week 12 of last year. 26.3, 28.74, 18.34, 19.72, 11.68 was his low watermark after that against New England last year. Then 40 points in week 17. Going into 2019, 15.96, 22.22, 18.32, New England blows him up again with 18.72 and then 17.46 to close out this last little stretch here against Tennessee. The floor is safer on Josh Allen than it is on Daniel Jones. Certainly. Well, you also need it. It's that floor. You desperately require those rushing points because he doesn't give you anything passing. At least Jones is giving you something through the air passing. Even with guys like Shepard down, you still get Saquon coming back. Evan Ingram's going to be back. You still have Golden Tate there. I, when I'm signing a quarterback, when I'm bringing a guy onto my roster, you know, for fantasy or, or whatever, I'm looking for a minimum of, hey, I need 275 and two, potentially three out of you any given week. That's the, that's kind of the marker. If you're giving me rushing, then I'm really dancing around. But if I have to rely on 45, 40, 45, 50 yards rushing plus a touchdown just to make up for the passing you're not giving me, that terrifies me because if a team decides to just play contain on him and he's not getting forced out of the pocket where he can go run around, there's not enough designed runs for the guy to make it, make it worthwhile. And I get what you're saying. Last year, he caught a lot of people by surprise, but you know, Blake Bortles did that to people too. And you know, Marcus Mariota did that to people too. And those guys are, you know, now, now playing number two roles on their respective teams. I just can't get excited about it because I don't feel like the sustainability is there. 
because the NFL always catches up. So, and, and again, it's a matter of strategy and the way you want to play it. Josh Allen, tons of upside. I won't dispute that. He gives you a rushing floor. I won't dispute that. But the way he plays lacks long-term sustainability, especially if you're playing in a keeper or dynasty format. If you're just doing single year redraft and you just need a guy for this week, next week, and the week after, whatever, man, go get him because he's probably going to give you some decent numbers in the next three weeks. But if I've got to trust him with my fantasy championship on the line, I might be a little more terrified because he gives me those butterflies. I don't hate that take, but man, was Daniel Jones a bad example for your argument there. He's thrown for 225 yards or fewer in each of the last three games. He has two, one, and three interceptions, and his rushing ceiling in those games was 33 yards. True, and I use Daniel Jones based on just what I've seen on film, not so much the fact that he's had everybody around him dead. He showed up and Saquon Barkley got hurt. Their biggest weapons off the field. Evan Ingram down. Sterling Shepard out. They just finally got Golden Tate back. He's been playing with not even Division I wide receivers out there. These guys have been pretty rough. He probably had better receivers at Duke. I'm looking for this team to start coming back together and start seeing more of those weeks like the first when he came out. And he came out, he put up, what, 25? How many points did he have in that first week he started? 34.2 against Tampa Thir- Bay. Yeah, 34 points against Tampa. Now, Tampa's not a great defense by any measure. But if you're telling me that you know he can get two-thirds of that most weeks with a healthy group or even near healthy group, I'm not mad about it. I'll take it. But you got to force a lot. And a lot of those interceptions weren't on him. I watched a lot of tip balls get picked off. But yeah, you're right. Probably based purely on numbers. Not a great example. But I have watched him a little bit. And his maturation as a passer has really impressed me because I didn't love him draft process either. But man, he's come a long way. And I think if I'm building long term or thinking long term, it might be a guy I have more faith in. Sure, I can I can buy the Daniel Jones over Josh Allen dynasty argument. I just I you couldn't pay me to do it next week. Well, Daniel Jones has like what Miami, Washington. What slack jaw defense do they have next week? The Giants have the Cardinals. The Bills have Miami. I'm taking Josh Allen against the Dolphins all day, every day. I mean, the the Cardinals are a good matchup too, but that schedule stays just as easy for the Bills. Yeah. Okay. So I will take him next week. Josh Allen's playing Miami, or he's playing Washington. You know, I'll take almost any quarterback playing those two. Uh, honestly, Joe, I'd pop you into my lineup if you were playing one of those two defenses. <laughs> don't do that. So <laughs> don't do that. I'm not physically <laughs> capable of playing in the NFL. It's a bad idea. But uh, what I'm getting at is that they are so terrible defensively that I don't think it matters who you have. And Josh Allen should be in for a big, big day. Um, you know, I, I generally just try to position myself quarterbacks. I try to steal the productivity of the other guys around them. So who... Who are the productive guys in Buffalo? You know, is it going to be, was it John Brown? Is it going to John be Brown's going to have three touchdowns next week? Oh, put it on the board. <laughs> I know who's going to be on your cheap dates lineup. I don't think he'll be that cheap, but he'll we'll be on see. the lineup for sure. We will see. All right, guys, we got a little off the rails here. Let's move into running backs. We got Chase Edmonds at 26% ownership, Daryl Henderson at 24 and Alexander Madison at 19%. I want to start out with Chase Edmonds. From what I saw in the last game, pretty impressive, but that's Atlanta's defense. I'm not taking that, you know, really to heart. But could this be one of the better one-two punches at the running back position this season? I mean, obviously, it's not like San Francisco or anything, but I feel like this could be a pretty good tandem to own. He is getting only about a quarter of the snaps, so I'm still kind of looking at him in the Austin Eckler handcuff with value kind of category from last year. But I think Chase Edmonds, if you if he's out there on your waiver wire and you own David Johnson— you absolutely need to have Chase Edmonds because he's an amazing insurance plan. And if they're in a good matchup, you might be able to get away with starting both if you're in a bye week situation that's got you in trouble. You know, Chase Edmonds is a guy that I definitely, definitely want to have on my roster right now. Uh, to me, he feels like a better fit in this offense than even David Johnson. And I like Johnson quite a bit. But something about Edmonds, he's just got a little bit more Zuzu right now. He's got a little more wiggle in his step. He just seems like the kind of guy that can be a real impact player. And it might be almost like comparing Eckler to Mel Gordon. No one's going to dispute Mel Gordon is probably the, the quote better back, but Eckler might be the better fit and is a little more explosive in his role. So Edmonds is certainly worth having. And if you've got Johnson, you should probably go get Edmonds. And heck, if you're just thin at running back, I might be willing to go ahead and dump some of these guys that aren't performing and sit on chase Edmonds. All right. So that covers Edmonds. Any tidbits on Henderson or Madison while we're here? Or again, we're just picking up 
good handcuffs guys you want to have for down the stretch? I don't even know based on what we've seen if Daryl Henderson is a good handcuff. I think he might just be an okay handcuff. Well, I don't think he's the handcuff at all to Gurley. Uh, this no, is Malcolm Brown see. is, but Henderson is getting some touches at that point if Gurley's down. Yeah, yeah Henderson's not the handcuff at all. It, it is Malcolm Brown. He's going to be the handcuff to Gurley. Henderson did have 6.2 yards a carry, though, against a, a pretty decent 49ers defense. He showed a little bit of uh, a little bit of explosion, a little bit of shiftiness, kind of the things we saw with, with him at Memphis. And uh, he's certainly a guy worth looking at. I think he was overhyped in the preseason. People were overdrafting him, imagining him as, as some kind of Alvin Kamara to Todd Gurley. And, and I think that's a little ridiculous. But two targets, he had a catch. Yeah, he only had nine yards. But seven for 39, it was actually 5.6 yards an attempt. I'll take it. You know, that that's not awful. And if you're telling me Todd Gurley's going to miss another game, Malcolm Brown wasn't particularly effective. I wouldn't be shocked to see Henderson's usage go up. So if you've got a spot on your roster or if you're dumping a garbage player or somebody who's hurt, hurt, you know, hit the IR, Henderson's worth an ad. You know, Madison, same kind of thing. If you've got Dal Cook or if anything should happen to Dal Cook, he suddenly becomes a, you know, running back one, two level player. Henderson's third on this list for me, but I think he might be the better stash regardless of injury because I think that he could have his own value later on in the season. I think the other guys pretty much have shown their value, which is decent, but I think Henderson's could be more. Sure. All right, Joe, any low owned running backs you want to throw out there for us? We'll run through them pretty quickly. They're all like 5% owned except Darius Geis, but Mark Walton, he got six targets in week six. He was in on 42% of the snaps. He's really become the Kalen Balaj in that offense. And if it ever gets any better, he's a decent stash. Benny Snell, 48% of the snaps. Wendell Smallwood is owned in 0.1% of leagues. If Chris Thompson's down, he might fall into that role. Obviously, that offense isn't that good, but in deeper leagues, you might need him. And Darius Geis is only owned in 26% of leagues. There's a chance he comes back off that IR, so give it a shot if you're desperate. You know, a little something on Benny Snell, and I don't know if you guys noticed this if you watched the Steelers game. Does he look a little slimmed up versus how he looked when he was at uh, Kentucky? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, he looks a little trimmed up, and I feel like he had a little bit more burst in the second level there, you know, making a guy miss here, making a guy miss there, little kind of one-step cuts. And, uh, you know, a a guy that kind of looked almost like a ploter coming out, he might have a little bit more juice to him than uh, people realized. He's really kind of followed the Jordan Howard path for me. (laughs) Jordan Howard looked fat last year, and he looks pretty slim this year. (laughs) So, so they got off the steak and shake diet and decided to go ahead and go to Panera. Like, what are we, <laughs> yeah. what are we talking they're, about? <laughs> they're hanging out together. That's what's going on. All right, let's dive into wide receivers, guys. We got Jamison Crowder at 50% ownership and Dante Pettis at 22%. Both of these feel kind of self-explanatory. And we've talked in the past about Jamison Crowder, especially with Donald coming back. I know last week, both of y'all, I think, mentioned that Crowder was getting a ton of targets in that offense with Donald. So we just kind of saw more of that this week. I do want to ask you how you feel about Demarius Thomas, though, Joe. I mean, he was pretty relevant this week. Demarius Thomas is on my lower owned list. He was more than relevant. He played 80% of the snaps. Like, there is a world where he becomes the possession receiver on that team. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, I mean, it'll really depend on how this offense matures with guys like Herndon coming back and maybe see if Robbie Anderson gets a few more looks. But Demarius is a reliable guy, and he knows the offense. Wouldn't be shocked to see him be a a usable asset, so to speak, as we move towards the fantasy playoffs. Side note on Pettis, 70% of the snaps for the first time this year. He he really could be emerging, and that offense hasn't shown anyone that's emerging as their number one wide receiver yet. Yeah, and six targets is what I needed to see. I mean, six targets. He only had three catches, and he had a drop that was pretty egregious. But ugly, ugly yeah, drop. Yeah, it was a pretty bad drop, but that's also, he's had issues with drops all year. So I kind of look at that and I'm like, well, I mean, they're only going to get that worked out of him by continuing to throw him the rock. You're going to have to pepper the guy with targets and you're going to have to deal with the, you know, some of these drops here and there. But I always go back to the, you know, Jerry Rice had problems with drops early in his career too. Worked out okay for him. Dante Pettis, Jerry Rice comp. Let's do that. (laughs) (laughs) It's a little gross. No, It's a little gross. I know it's a little gross, but I'm just saying that when we get hung up on things like drops, You know, I try to look back and say, well, you know what? Jerry Rice had an issue with drops going into like his second season. And so that's where we're at with Pettis. I'm not saying Pettis is Rice 
or even a legit comp to rice because nobody really is. However, I try not to get too hung up on those drops. I do like the 70% snap share. I do like the six targets and I do like going three for 45 because that means he's getting downfield. All right, Joe, I played spoiler for Demarius Thomas on your loan list, but who are the other guys on the list? Uh, I just got a couple more. I had Dante Pettis on there too, but he was obviously part of the main segment. Antonio Callaway, he was in on almost 70% of the snaps in week six. He's only 1.6% owned. If that Browns offense ever turns into what we hoped it was before the season, he could be a guy with some value. And then Cedric Wilson for the Cowboys. That was really surprising. When Amari Cooper went down, he played 61% of the snaps in his absence. I don't know what's going on with Cooper. I don't know what Cedric Wilson means to that offense, but if you're in a really deep league in a dynasty, he's only in 0% of leagues at this point. Like he's not even showing up on the radar. Mm. Mm. Man, I like it. That's bold. Get it out there. It's deep, deep. Like that's 30 guys on your bench kind of deep. That's a deep. Like, I mean, we're like spelunking now. Yes, we're spelunking without a light at Cedric yeah. Wilson. But like, if that's the kind of league you're in, he's worth a shot with 61% of the snaps. I just love that we worked did, spelunking into the show. Did, Woo! did the guy who just made the Pettis Rice comparison talk about being bold? I did. I did. Sure did. I did. And to be fair, I did say we're not comparing Pettis to Rice. I'm just saying let's not get too hung up on drops. Let's <laughs> let's not mischaracterize what I said, Murph. Let's mischaracterize like what he said, Murph. Yeah, that'd be like if Noah Fant snapped off on the sideline at a reporter, and then me and Joe were like, "Well, you know, Shannon Sharp had a bad mouth earlier in his career too." But, you know, you got over it. I mean, oh, but he did. I love that comp. I the, love that. Yeah. Comp. <laughs> I really. Hey, man, I hope Noah Fant turns into Shannon Sharp. That'd be great. Oh, we yeah. just named this show the one where Dante Pettis is Jerry Rice and Noah Fant is Shannon Sharp. That's it. <laughs> People gonna be like, "What in the hell are these people?" <laughs> That's clearly the if I've ever heard of it. Click bait. <laughs> oh gosh, I like it. Uh, still in Rotor Bros format. I love it, Joe. Shout out to the Rotor Bros, Chris McConnell, Mark Wemkin. Hadn't said their names in a minute, so go check them out. All right, let's move into tight ends, finish this up. We got Chris Herndon listed here, kind of the obvious one, 26% ownership. Like I mentioned to start the show, minor news is he was activated. He's on the roster. Whether he'll play this week or not, still up in the air. We'll have more on Thursday with the injury roundup. Still dealing with a hamstring injury, but Definitely go pick him up. Joe, any low owned tight ends you want to throw out? Dallas Godert, 46 snaps to Earth's 52, 70% ish snaps in each of the last three weeks. And Ricky Seals Jones, he had a 68% snap share and six targets. Could be a fluke, but if you're in a deeper league, he's only 2.6% owned. I don't know what the status is on Njoku, but RSJ could be a, a decent streamer. Ricky Seals Jones is a thing that the fantasy community has been trying to will into existence for a couple of years now. And I, I just, I can't buy him. I just, I, he makes me sad at this point and, and I can't do it. I, I really need you to help me here. S- sell me on some RSJ. I can't, I can't at all. I think it's probably <laughs> a fluke, but I think if you're trying to pay down at tight end for DFS and you mm. make a lot of lineups, he's a decent flyer. I'm not selling you that he's going to be a thing season long. I just think, you know, if a guy's on the field for 68% of the snaps and you're searching for a touchdown and a good matchup, it's worth a shot. How about Dawson Knox? I love Dawson Knox. I've, I think we've talked about him so much on this, but he's coming off the bye week. So he's definitely going to be out there. Yeah. I mean, we're talking five and a half or so percent owned, 6% owned and a great matchup as we talked about with Josh Allen. So there could be some, uh, some Dawson Knox love in our near future. All right, guys, and that'll do it for our week six review show. This was fun. We made a lot of weird comparisons and a lot of Jeff jokes. Par for the course. We'll be back on Thursday with our week seven preview show, our what to watch for us, our cheap dates, all the good stuff. Maybe a few less Jeff jokes. We'll try. No. No promises. Not going to happen. There will only be more Jeff jokes. (laughs) You're welcome. We'll, we'll, We'll balance it with Jimmy G jokes. How does that sound, Joe? I got it. On it. (laughs) <laughs> get his notepad out right now starting to starting to think him up yep all right for jeff at nfl underscore d mateo for joe at human stat sheet on twitter and of course myself at murphy fft or find us on the nfl fantasy football discussion group on facebook we'll see you on thursday bye guys later i love Knox. 
Of course you do. Shut up. Yeah. Thanks for listening to the <laughs> Fantasy Takeaway Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And follow the show on Twitter at FF Takeaway. Thank you.